belong to the king. I'm a child of his love. I shall dwell in his palace so fair. For he tells of its bliss in yon heaven above, and his children its splendor shall share. I belong to the king. I'm a child of his love, and he never forsaketh his own. He will call me someday to his palace above. I shall dwell by his glorified throne. I belong to the king, and he loves me, I know for his mercy and kindness so free are unceasingly mine wheresoever I go and my refuge unfailing is he I belong to the king I'm a child of his love and he never something he loved you enough to die for you yeah. Yeah. greater love hath no man than this and a man lay down his life for his friend all right 483 all right for time's sake uh, we will skip verse 3 verse 3 we will skip here we go there is a name I love to hear I love to sing his word but it sounds like music in my ear the sweetest name on earth. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Because he first loved me. It tells me of a Savior's love who died to set me free. It tells me of his precious blood the sinner's perfect plea. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Because he first loved me. It tells of one whose loving heart can feel my deepest woe. Who in each sorrow bears a part that none can bear below. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Because he first loved me. Hey, amen. amen. All right, amen. please stand. Please stand. Open up your red hymnals to 149, please. 149. 
I don't know what you're going through in life, but hey, it'll be worth it all when we see Jesus yes, Christ. Yes, and especially when that tempter will be banished and Amen. we lay our Amen. burdens down, you're definitely going to sing that chorus, it will be worth it all. All right, here we go. Our times a day seems long, our trials are to bear. We're tempted to complain, to murmur and despair. But Christ will soon appear to catch his bride away. All tears forever over in God's eternal day. sisters this day Lord and just like any other day Lord we have this day to always do things that according to your glory Lord and not ours Father we ask that you watch over those who are on their way here to get them here safely Amen. Lord we ask you to watch over those who are not able to make it those who are watching online and ask Lord that you give pastor the Holy Spirit unction to teach Jesus. the word Lord Amen. and ask these things in Jesus Christ our Lord to say we pray Amen. 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 You may be seated. You may be seated. All right. Take away your white hymnals. Uh, not take away. Take out your white hymnals. <laughs> no, take them away. We'll never take them away. We'll never take them away. White Amen. hymnals, that'll be the last one we take away. All right. Take out your white hymnals, please. And I love this song. Let's sing uh, page uh, 
It's not there. Oh, they oh there it is. Five. It's five. It's five. <laughs> <laughs> they, took <it> <laughs> they took it away. They took it away. They edited it out like that IV. <laughs> Which version do you have? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea. Are you missing a five? Is anyone missing a five? <laughs> Verse five? <laughs> All right. Oh, speaking of which, five verses, coincidentally. Okay, so we haven't sang this for a lo long time, actually. Okay, so what we're going to do is uh, sing one, four, and five. All right? One, four, and five. Here we go. Far away in the depth of my spirit tonight rolls a melody sweeter than song. In celestial light strength it unceasingly falls o'er my soul like an infinite calm. Peace, peace, wonderful peace coming down from the Father above. Sweep over my spirit the ransom will sing in that heavenly kingdom shall be peace peace wonderful peace coming down from the father above sweep over my spirit forever I pray in fathomless person, but I got a really special announcement that I think you'll all be happy to hear. So I had a surprise call from one of my teachers back at PBI. So he's a deacon at Dr. Rutland, or you know, former Dr. Rutland's church, now it's Pastor Donovan's church. So Brother Turner, Brother Turner, he's coming here. So he'll be coming here oh, at uh, last week of June or first week of July, so I'm not sure. So, Brother Turner will be coming here with Pastor Ron Robinson. He is Pastor John Robinson's father. Oh. Pastor Ron Robinson, he's a pastor at Alaska, but this man, actually, so he knew what it was like in the fundamentalist stuff. He, was, he worked as Lester Roloff's associate, was uh, at the staff at Jack Kyle's, but then, you know, once he, you know, what happens? You see some things going on at fundamentalist churches, so now, uh, once he got into Dr. Ruckman stuff, he became a Bible-believing pastor. So he's like full-fledged, all the way Bible-believing. I actually referred to him in my book one time. So Pastor Ron Robinson, I can't wait to hear him preach. I'm sure it's going to be very, very exciting. So he's going to be preaching, and then Brother Turner will be teaching. So he was my visitation teacher. Last time I heard him teach was 14 years ago. I know, I look young, but believe me, that was a long time ago. So, man, I feel old even though I'm young. But anyway, so Brother Turner, he'll be teaching whatever the Lord leads on his heart. So he's the one that taught us visitation. If it weren't for him, I wouldn't have had the 
uh, motivation to do apologetics, actually. So if people online think I'm so smart, I fooled all of you. It's because I had good, godly, Bible-believing leaders I submitted Amen. to. Amen. And that's why I keep stressing on going to a Bible-believing church and submitting. It will change your life. Because of that, he covered all the cults, and I was like so gung-ho after that one. So he'll have a lot of interesting things that the Lord will lay on his heart. So Lord willing, though, Lord willing, they'll drop by last week of June or first week of July. If any of you are occupied on those weeks, I was thinking about doing fellowship on Saturday when they come down. So if any of you are occupied on those weeks, please let me know. All right, please let me know. All right, so your new bulletin is done. So your May bulletin. So this is the first page right here. In the first page, it mentions about the volunteers and the church programs needed. So if any of you want to do something in the church and serve God, that's what this bulletin's for. It gives you these things to participate in, which we always offer. Singing specials, working at the nursery, anyone who wants to teach or preach on this pulpit, street preach, do visitation, or pass out tracts and new convert materials. Uh, the progress of last month is also mentioned right here. So 500 tracts and seven new convert materials, uh, seven Bibles taken. Oh, actually, I forgot to count in the ones that Barbara gave out. So Sister Barbara gave out a whole bunch of Ruckman reference Bibles. So if I were to count all those, it would probably be ten. So, you know, that's how much money uh, she spent to give to people. So that's a blessing. Thank God for her. Pray for her and Brother Emilia's traveling mercies, all right? Amen. Where they're gone, pray that they come back safely. Uh, the Internet Ministry, uh, no surprise, 6,452 comments, 5,157 new subscribers, and 12,734 new shares. There were about eight souls saved last month, amen. Prayers answered. Well, that was, that was something, right? The prayers answered. So, like I told you, we had trolls coming in inside our church. There are so many people who attacked us online, and the Lord judged every single one of our enemies within less than a season. So, I mean, uh, you saw me preaching the sermon, and I prayed, and all of you were praying too. And Brother Chuck at home, God knows how many hours he was praying. He was like, Pastor, I'm going to start praying for those trolls and those enemies who attack you. When he says that, you better be scared, <laughs> people out there. So the Lord blessed it. And uh, uh, so I posted a video of that. I'm not going to tell you what happened. But if you saw that video, the Lord judged every single one of them, took care of them, and then took protected us. So praise the Lord for that one. That is a mighty answer to prayer. I didn't see anything like that within a short time span, actually. Other fruits is that um, the greatest, perhaps one of the greatest fruits in our ministry is that we opened up discipleship now. So finally, this is a great, one of the greatest. Why? Because it gives every one of you a chance to grow spiritually more. That is bigger. This is bigger than all the teachings that I do on the Internet. You got to understand. It's discipleship for you because it gets you to spiritually mature and grow and actually experience yourself. So if I were to choose, I'm going to be honest with you. If I choose YouTube or discipleship, if I choose church building or discipleship, I choose discipleship. Amen. The reason why is because what gets your pastor so motivated more is to see a person himself or herself actually spiritually growing. That's not right. just giving money, not just building up the membership in church, and not uh, just uh, clicking on the views. It's a person, him or herself, that spiritually grows. That one is the greatest joy to the pastor. All right, uh, page one also lists the monthly tithing progress as well. Memory verses, so you have a chance. This week is reviewing uh, Psalms chapter 23, all right? So you all reviewed Psalms 23, memorize that whole chapter now. And then we're going to start on Psalms chapter 8. That will be the next Psalms we'll be memorizing, all right? Psalms chapter 8. Uh, it lists in page 2 the total monthly progress as well. So if you kept up with your Bible reading, your prayer time, and your track passing, your church attendance, your soul winning attendance, and then your tithing and then the memory verses, all of that's recorded so as to encourage you that you did accomplish something last month despite of how spiritually weak and inferior you think you are. That's why this paper is here to encourage you. All right, it also lists the total progress of 2017 by the end of 
uh, from the beginning of 2018 to now. So if you kept up in this small amount of work, an average of 10 members would have read half of the Bible. An average of 10 members would have spent nearly 24 hours of winning lost souls. San Jose Bible Baptist Church would have prayed nearly 400 hours for God to save lost souls, meet the needs of fellow Christians, support over 50 ministers and ministries, and so much more. San Jose Bible Baptist Church would have passed that, uh, would have passed well over 3,000 tracks. San Jose Bible Baptist Church has nearly 75 souls to salvation. San Jose Bible Baptist Church would have memorized three entire Bible chapters. Do you realize that? If you kept up with these little things, yep. you would have realized how much you uh, have memorized. And not only three entire Bible chapters, even one entire Bible doctrine as well within just six months. And don't forget the fruits from answered prayers, internet ministry results, and personal testimonies, scores of them. So the progress of our small little church. So praise the Lord for that. This, as I mentioned, this monthly bulletin is always mentioned. Why? So as to, for, to encourage you and to op uh, remind you of what we're here for and how we're progressing in the Lord. Yes, All right. Uh, the next pages is your Bible reading chart. It's listed out over here. Just three tracks a day, 15 minutes of prayer, and then uh, three chapters of the Bible. And then basically you would have uh, accomplished all of that progress that I mentioned before. All right, the prayer list. So something, uh, our prayer list is right here on front and back. We have a new missionary, Mike Huggins, uh, Dr. Ruckman's son. That, that he'll probably even do that chalk talk like his dad did. So that'll be a blessing. So he's his stepson. He's his stepson. He actually taught at PBI as well. So he's going to be. So he's definitely coming. He's coming at August. Uh, second week of August, second week of August. So he'll be here second week of August. That's something you don't want to miss out. So he'll be coming. Uh, we got a special. So let's lift up our voices like a trumpet. Amen. All right. Would you be free from the burden of sin? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you or evil a victory win? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, there is power, wonder-working power in the blood, in the blood of, the lamb. of the Lamb. There is power, there is power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you be wider, much wider than snow? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Sin stains are lost in its life-giving flow. There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, there is power, wonder-working power in the blood. In the blood of the Lamb. Of the lamb. There is power, there is power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you do service for Jesus, your King? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you live daily his praises to sing? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, there is power, wonder-working power in the blood, in the blood of the Lamb. Of the lamb. There is power, there is power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Brother Tom can take the Lord's offering and ask God's blessing upon the church service with the word of prayer. Father, thank you so much. I, I have to say this. Thank you so much for the weather, Lord, because we had That's a good, really time preaching. We were able to use it. <laughs> Lord, thank you also for advances in technology and air conditioning because, Lord, yeah, yeah, that's right. we able to pay attention in the hot weather, Lord. I don't know. We're, as, we're not as tough as the people back then in the Great Awakening times. But Come on. Thank you so much, Lord. Heavenly Father, I know that all of us are going through troubles, but we look at our missionaries who are trying to spread your gospel and Bible-believing Christianity all over the world, and they're struggling, Lord, and they That's need right. you. Come they on. need the power of the blood on, on them every single day as they go out, whether or not they're going out preaching or teaching or doing visitations or just even at home struggling with their problems, Lord. They need you and the power of your son's blood. Please, yeah, I pray that you'll please fill them with the Spirit and have, have mercy on them, Lord, and help them do your work here in, in this world, Lord, as they're still here. And Lord, I pray that we'll please be able to give cheerfully and 
hopefully as much as we can to these missionaries because they really are trying their hardest. We can all we can all see that through their letters and you know all the prayer requests that they've been asking lord we, we know they're not slacking off so come please, on we pray that you'll help them and help us help them as well pray this in jesus name amen amen look at the book of jeremiah and we will look at chapter 4, please, chapter 4. The prophet Jeremiah, he has been preaching his heart out to the children of Israel for them to repent and for them to seek after the Lord. But the city of Jerusalem has always closed its ears against the people of God and they will not listen. They will not listen. And you can talk about how much discouragement Jeremiah went through. Now, if you start off at verse 1, at Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 1, If thou wilt return, O Israel, saith the Lord, return unto me, and if thou wilt put away thine abominations out of my sight, then shalt thou not remove. And thou shalt swear the Lord liveth in truth, in judgment and in righteousness, and the nations shall bless themselves in him, and in him shall they glory. For thus saith the Lord to the men of Judah and Jerusalem, Break up your fallow ground, and sow not among thorns. Circumcise yourselves to the Lord, and take away the foreskins of your heart, ye men of Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem, lest my fury come forth like fire, and burn that none can quench it because of the evil of your doings. Now notice that Jeremiah, he's preaching a very hard message here. And there's a good sermon that can be preached from actually at verse 3. Break up your fallow ground. And you got to realize the ground of this area and this world, it is expected to be hard ground. It is expected when you sow in seeds, it's not going to grow. It's expected when you water and you pass out thousands of seeds, you're not going to see anything. So you know what the ground needs? It needs to be broken up. That's what it needs. It needs to be broken up. And if you keep reading the end of chapter 4, notice that he preached all the way till the end. And then Jeremiah, he preached again all the way to the end from chapter 5. And then he preaches again all the way to the end at the end of chapter 6. And then it goes on and on and on with chapter 7. And guess what? Jeremiah, he's getting discouraged. Jeremiah, he feels like quitting. He feels like that he can't take it anymore, that he can't preach God's word. I mean, now look back at Jeremiah chapter 1 now. Look back at Jeremiah chapter 1. I mean, you got to realize this. Jeremiah, to begin with, did not want to go in the ministry. To begin with, he did not, uh, he felt like he was incapable. And guess what? After all that preaching hard against the children of Israel, he got not one. Not one. No one would listen. Now you talk about discouragement. You talk about suffering. And then I can, re re I can recall Jeremiah thinking back at chapter 1 and verse 1. The words of Jeremiah, the son of Hilkiah, of the priests that were in Anathoth in the land of Benjamin, to whom the word of the Lord came in the days of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah, in the thirteenth year of his reign. He came also in the days of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king. Let's jump down all the way to verse 4. Then the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee. And I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. Verse 6. That feels like you. Then said I, Ah, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak, for I am a child. But the Lord said unto me, Say not, I am a child, for thou shalt go to all that I shall send thee, and whatsoever I command thee, thou shalt speak. Be not afraid of their faces, for I am with thee to deliver thee, saith the Lord. You know what? God told Jeremiah, Don't be afraid. I'm going to be with you. I, <coughs> I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to have you preach. Now, what are you driving at, preacher, going through the life of Jeremiah? Be patient with me right here. I'm trying to tell you something. If you can picture yourself like Jeremiah. If you can picture yourself like Jeremiah, you're feel, feeling like that right now. 
that you went to church, you passed out tracts, you prayed, you read the Bible. You thought that if you were going to go to some place or if you're going to come to this church or if you start serving God that you're going to set the world on fire. That's not true. That's not reality. Reality is, is that when you sow a seed, it's going to, the birds, which is demons, the devils, are going to come up and eat it up. That's what's going to happen. You think you're going to get your first soul saved as soon as you started discipleship class? Did you think that as soon as you started praying that you're going to uh, see a lot of people listening to you at least? Did you think that by starting to come to this church that you can do great things for God? That's not how it goes. You know how it goes? You sow a seed, and then a bird comes down and eats up that seed that you planted. And then you sow in hundreds, and the birds come down and eat up that seed. And then you recall yourself back at chapter 1 when God told you, through the preaching of the word, hey, you know you got to attend discipleship class. Hey, you know you got to attend street preaching, visitation. You know you got to start praying. You got to start reading the Bible. Hey, you know you got to preach. You got to teach. And then you told the Lord to begin with, Lord, I told you to begin with, I am not capable. I am not ready. I don't think I can do it. And that's what the devil's trying to do, bring back your past. Amen, preach. And trying to remind you that, see, you weren't ready after all, you weren't capable after all, and you should stop coming to church, you should stop reading the Bible, you should stop praying, you should stop coming to soul winning. Why bother? I mean, you sowed in the seeds and the birds came and picked it up. Not only that, you sinned here. You backslid something over there. Why keep going? Why bother? That's what's going on. Jeremiah, you know what he is? Why am I harping on Jeremiah so much? Because he is the perfect person for you Christians, and I mean you Christians today. No other time period is perfectly applicable than today for Jeremiah. You know why? Because at the last day of the nation of Israel, when God was about to pour his judgment, he sent in a Jeremiah, and no one listened to him. He didn't have a church at all. You think that you get discouraged with small people at church? He didn't even have a church at all. He probably only led an Ethiopian eunuch or a servant to salvation and then saved him from God's judgment, but that was it. But you know what? He kept going for the Lord. And you know what he said? He said that he felt like that he should give up. He felt like he is unworthy. He felt like that he is not called to preach. In fact, he even said one time that I will not mention the ne name of my Lord God anymore. He even said that. He was at that point of bitterness. He was at that point of getting tired. He was at that point of giving up where he said, I'm not going to mention God anymore. But you know what? You got to realize this. There are people out there that you just don't know about who have not bowed the knee yet to Baal. There are people out there who are sinning and messing up, but they know you're right, even though they don't come to your church. Let me repeat that. There are people out there who know what you're doing is right, and you don't see them at our church. That's good, amen. Oh, where's your evidence? Jeremiah again. What happened? The king, the big shot, the king himself of Judah. He went to Jeremiah and said, tell me what God said, tell me what God said. I'm afraid. I'm afraid of my enemies. That king protected Jeremiah, actually. Even though the princes and the government leaders, they all persecuted and imprisoned Jeremiah. You know what happened? I'll tell you what happened. The king kept protecting Jeremiah, even though the king did not go all the way, even though he was probably not saved. But he listened. He realized there's something right about Jeremiah. And I'm going to tell you something. When you come out to street preaching and you hold a sign and then you preach on the streets, those people aren't going to come to your church. But they know you're right. Those tracks that you left on the doors after every house that you knocked, you left a track over there. And they won't come to your church. But guess what? They know you're right. Guess what? The people that you pray for, the people who you pray for to get saved, to get right with God, to come back to church, to become a Bible-believing Christian, you're not going to see them change. You're not going to see an outward answer to prayer. But guess what? They know you're right. And you know what this day and age needs? We need more people in church. We need a lot of people to get saved. A lot of people to build up the subscribers on the internet. No, 
People need to see that you're right, that God's word is right, and they're wrong. That's what they need to see, and that's what God's going to judge them for at the final judgment. Yeah, that's good. So you know what? You've accomplished your job. You've done your duty, and don't think that this is nothing. Don't think that this is pitiful. Don't think that your work is nothing. There are people out there who are listening, and God will judge them, and they know you're right. And guess what? Those people can deceive themselves and think that they're right because the Bible says that God will give them a lie if they don't want the truth and he will deceive their hearts and they will still mock you. They will still ignore you. They will still pretend that you're the bad guys and they themselves are the good guys. But I'm going to tell you something. Deep down inside their hearts, the Holy Spirit is convicting them and knocking on their heart. You know you're wrong about something. And it gives them that uncomfortable feeling. And God will expose that at the judgment. Amen. If you think that they're right, if you think, oh, I don't think so, then how can God judge them at the judgment, huh? How can God judge them at the judgment? You know you were wrong about something right here, so I have to judge you for that. He's going to expose their heart. He's going to show them what they were wrong about, and they know it, and they can't make an excuse for it. So trust me, those people, they may be deceived, but there is somewhere there that the Lord knows in some gray area of their heart that they're wrong about. I'm going to tell you something, church, is that you got to keep in the fight. You can't quit. And it is easy to throw in the towel. But this is the day and age you're living in. Is Jeremiah's day and age. We're not in Great Awakening revivals. Okay? We're not Billy Graham where we bring in people who pretend to get saved or come down on the altar. We're not compromisers like other preachers do in building up politics with friends with different pastors so we don't hurt their feelings so that we can build in more members. We don't, I don't have to compromise. Look, I love, uh, I believe that if you have no church to go to, if there is no Bible-believing church in your area, I would recommend a fundamentalist Baptist church. But even I myself will not compromise to what they're doing. I absolutely refuse to. This church doesn't have to, and you don't have to. You know why? Because this is the day and age you're expecting. Not with 200 members, 300 members, 1,000 members. This is the day and age. Jeremiah, yes. you got to expect that. Amen. What did you expect? I thought that we're going to set the world on fire. I thought that we're going to get so saved. I thought that we had that passion, that vision. Of course we do. And that will never die out, and that will never die out in my heart. But, you know, it's not just hope for the best. It's always prepare for the worst. You forgot that part. You got to realize this. This is the worst day and age. And if I thought like you did, if I thought like you did that, oh, there's hardly anyone coming to church and no one's listening to me street preaching and no one got saved this month. If I thought like you did, I would not be here today. You probably would not have gotten saved. You probably would not have known Bible-believing truth. The Internet, a lot of those people would not have been discipled and they would have led souls to salvation themselves. You know how the fruit comes? The fruit always comes out after the worst. You prepare for the worst. Hoping for the best comes out after that. Hoping for the best comes in in little handfuls, like in between God dropping it here and there. That's good. Amen. It's not 24-7 revival. And if you would think that in your heart, then you would not give up the fight, you would not quit, and you would keep pressing on for Jesus Christ. They know you're right. They know you're right. I mean, look at Jeremiah 12, 10. Jeremiah chapter 12 and verse 10. Jeremiah chapter 12 and verse 10. You know what kind of sermon I'm preaching today? I'm preaching you a realistic sermon for today. For today's day and age. I'm going to preach you a realistic sermon today about today's day and age and what you got to realize and what you shouldn't be blinded. Look at Jeremiah chapter 12, verse 10. Many pastors have what? Destroyed my vineyard. They have trodden my portion underfoot. They have made my pleasant portion a desolate wilderness. What did you expect? That's the day and age we live in. There are too many churches and pastors who are getting tired out in the fight so they can't help but quit or retire. They can't help but say, this is too much, I can't handle it. Other pastors, they can't take it anymore with something so small. So they have to make compromises in making a fancy church building. In saying and preaching in a way where it tones down the volume. 
in doing gimmicks and niceties, that way you can draw in the crowd, and making social group programs, if you're reading Rick Warren books, if you're reading Jack Hiles books, and those guys to learn ways how to build up a bigger church, that shows where your heart is. Amen. Now don't get me wrong. You know, some fundamentalist Baptists, including Hiles, has some good stuff. Don't get me wrong. And sometimes I'll read their stuff about how to build up a church. But see, when you're... When did you buy that book? Why did you buy that book? That's where your heart lies, right? So is your heart centered on building a big church? A big internet? A big everything? This is not the kind of church that you should expect like Joel Osteen. Church you should expect is Jeremiah and Jeremiah and Jeremiah. Amen. And what people ought to expect from you is not, oh, these people are right. No, what they're going to look at you as, look at this ragged, bearded loser who looks like a bum on the street saying, repent or perish, repent or perish. Ha, 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 ha. That's right. That's what the world thinks of you. Yes, sir. That's a day and age. Isaiah, you got to realize this. Isaiah walked around naked preaching. Isaiah was walking around naked preaching. Ezekiel was eating dung when he was preaching. That's the kind of people the world is looking at as fools and fools and fools. But Amen. Paul says, we are made fools for Christ's sake. Amen. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish Amen. foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. Amen. So don't quit. Why do you want to quit? Why do you get tired? You should expect that is this day and age. What did you expect? You should expect that this is the day and age we live in, and you can't quit. You know why you can't quit? I'll give you one reason you can't quit. Let's look at these prophets right here, who are at the last day and age, and they were about to quit and throw in the towel. Let's look at some of these preachers right here on what made them keep on the firing line and what made them not quit. One is Jeremiah, for example. He was about to quit, right? He said, I will not make mention of the name of the Lord. You know what made him quit? But his word was in my heart as a burning fire. You know why you can't quit? Because there's something deep down in your heart that doesn't want to quit. Yeah. Oh, no, I want to quit. No, deep down inside your heart, it doesn't want to quit. Amen. There's something about when... You came into church and you were discouraged, you were down in the dumps, depressed, you felt like you lost your salvation. And as soon as the first tune of that hymn book, that those first words of the verse out of that hymn book was sung, your heart was going, yeah, yeah, amen. praise the Lord, hallelujah, amen. And you couldn't help it but just make mention of the name of the Lord. There was something when you were just tired and worn out and you didn't feel like coming to street preaching. And then when you just said the first verse out on the street, the heart was going, yeah, yes, yeah, yes. yeah, Amen. praise the Lord, Amen. There was something deep down inside your heart that didn't feel like when you bowed your head and closed your eyes to pray and when you opened up that King James Bible, there was something in your heart that went, yeah, 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 Amen, praise the Lord. It just wanted to make mention of the name of Jesus. I'm going to tell you something. You can quit. You can get out of this church. But I'm going to tell you this. You're going to have an uncomfortable feeling deep down inside your heart when you're about to eat your meal and you bow your head in prayer and you just made mention of the name of the Lord. There's something deep down inside your heart after you quit and run out of this church. You're going to hear some Christian hymn playing outside, maybe at the shopping mall or some other place or somebody's car. You're going to hear some hymn somewhere and then your heart's going to burn like a fire. There's something that where you feel like, well, I'm going to, avoid San Jose Bible Baptist Church. I'm not going to see them. And then when you stop at a red light, you see Gene Kim right in front of you. The wages of sin is dead. And there's something down inside your heart that burns up like a fire. And you can't run away. You can't run away from the preacher. You can't run away from God. You can't run away from that book. You can't get run away from God's calling. There's something deep down inside your heart where, you know, you say, well, I'm not going to watch Pastor Gene Kim anymore on YouTube. And all of a sudden, that annoying notification pops out, ding, and you're like, no, I ain't going to watch that, and you get rid of the notification. But when you're watching one video, this annoying video of this weird Asian guy just pops out with a doodle at the background. 
Something, see, you can't get rid of God. You can't get rid of God. And God, something deep down inside your heart is going to burn with you as with a burning fire. And you're going to watch us online even if you don't want to watch us and pretend you unsubscribed and left. You can leave our church and pretend that you're not part of this church, but you will see us somewhere, maybe knocking on your door 1030 in the morning when you're not at church. And we look at you and say, if you were to die today, are you 100% sure that you would go to heaven? There's something deep down inside our heart. It's going to be a burning fire and fire. You know what? When there are those days, this is going to be a realistic sermon. I'm going to give you, I'm going to show you my weak side. Pastors don't do that. If pastors show their weak side, then, you know, uh, I, I don't do that because uh, I know some of you may not understand this, but if I show weak sides and people will think how undependable the pastor is and they won't lean on his leadership and authority, but because this is a realistic sermon and I want you to understand that I can, that the stuff I'm going through is similar with what you're going through. So I'm just going to give a bit right here in a wise manner. But there were those moments when your pastor entertained thoughts where he was like thinking, oh man, I, I'm tired of preaching, I'm tired of teaching and you know, I can't do it anymore. People don't even come to church anyway. They just run away from church. And people, they're not going to get saved anyway. They're going to say, oh, the I don't like the tone of Pastor Kim's voice. And he didn't teach something that I wanted him to teach. And, you know, that kind of preaching, you could have worded it this way and that way. I'm sick and tired of that. Wasting days and hours in prayer just preaching and teaching something that I felt like the Lord led upon my heart. And people said, no, that's wrong. That's a mistake. I'm tired of doing that. But then, deep down inside my heart, God was saying, okay, quit preaching for one year. How would you feel? And I was like, I can't. And God's like, why? I was like, there's something about it being on this pulpit, Lord. There's something about opening up, opening up that King James Bible. There's something about it where I proclaim your name, preach in your word, yes. getting conviction, Amen. and seeing people Amen. come down on the altar, seeing some people cry in tears, seeing some people raising their hands to get saved in Jesus Christ, seeing some people saying, thank you, Pastor, for the sermon, seeing some people shouting and lifting up God the glory, raising up their hands or running around the room. There's something about it, Lord. I can't stop preaching. I can't stop Stop preaching, Lord. There's some authority. There's something about that power and that authority of giving out your word. And those of you who went on the pulpit, preached and taught, there's something about this. There's some power here. There's some unspeakable gift and power of God mysteriously moving, moving upon people's hearts, melting and changing people's lives. I can't stop. I can't stop preaching. I will try. But I can't imagine myself stopping preaching. And then if I hear one of Dr. David Peacock's sermon, if I hear one of Dr. David Walker's sermon, if I hear one of Dr. Ruckman's sermon, if I see Tom Cho preaching and Sean Lawler preaching, I can't sit on my chair anymore after that. I'm going to go, I want to preach! Amen. Amen. There's something deep down inside your heart that can't stop, that can't stop the fire. There's something about it that lingers in your heart about holding that sign once more out on the street. Yes. Passing a track to some old lady or some young child on the street. There's something about it seeing uh, when we go door knocking, a person bowing his or her head receiving Jesus Christ right in front of your eyes. Some of you missed that, didn't you? There's something deep down inside your heart and the Holy Spirit's convicting you. You recall those days where people would come down on the altar and bow on their knees in prayer. You recall those days where people will actually confess Jesus Christ for salvation right in front of your face. You recall those days where the preacher would preach hellfire and brimstone and you got under conviction. You recall those days where saints of God would shout amen and give God the glory. You recall those days where the old-fashioned hymns are opened up, giving him the hallelujahs and not those annoying drum bands. And yeah, you can go back to your worldly music. You can go back to those percussion drums. But there's something about it deep down inside your heart that wants to sing Amazing Grace after that. Amen. You can't get rid of it. You can't get rid of that fire. In this Laodicean day and age, you can't get rid of it. If you have the Holy Spirit in you, you can shut him out. You can try to ignore him. And yeah, you might yield to your flesh, but you're going to be a miserable louse. Guilt will well up in your mind. And there's just something about it that wants to feel clean again. Right. Something about it that wants to feel the fire again. That's right. 
I am sick and tired of saying, man, I remember those days back in the blowout. I remember those days back at summer camp. I'm sick and tired of that. I want it to be now on an old fashioned Sunday, on an every Sunday where we have the fire and give God the praise and get on fire and try to win souls. Get on fire and start praying. What happened to us? I'll tell you one, another one is, let's look at 1 Kings 19. 1 Kings 19. Let's look at another prophet right here. I don't usually preach like this. I just want people to know that this is the first time you may have seen me preach, and this is not how I usually preach. This is just, I'm, I'm laying all the cards on the table. This is just really Gene Kim right here. This is Gene Kim all exposed and open right here. This is him preaching from his heart. Let's look at 1 Kings. And we'll look at chapter 19. And look at verse 2. Then Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I make not thy life as the life of one of them by tomorrow, about this time. So Jezebel wanted to kill this prophet Elijah. But what happened right here? Verse 4. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, and came and sat down under a juniper tree, and he requested for himself that he might die, and said, It is enough now, O Lord. Take away my life, for I am not better than my father's. I don't know if any of you out there had these kind of thoughts where you just wanted to end your life because you feel so miserable. And there are just so many hard things going on in your life that you feel like slitting your wrist, hanging yourself, or ending it all. But I'm going to tell you something right here that Elijah, he felt like that. He was at a really apostate day and age. He wanted to kill himself. But I'm going to tell you something. You know what encouraged Elijah? I'll tell you what encouraged Elijah. Let's look what God told him at verse 18. Look at verse 18. Yet I have left me, how many? 7,000 in Israel, all the knees which have not bowed unto Baal, and every mouth which hath not kissed him. You know why you shouldn't be depressed and miserable? I'll tell you why. Because you're not alone. Can I repeat that again? Especially for people online who have no Bible-believing church to go to and they think they're all alone. You're not alone. Amen. That's right. And you members, it's amazing that you have a family who prays for you and loves you, but it is very possible you can be in a saved Bible-believing church and yet you feel very alone. That is very possible. And I'm going to tell you something as a pastor. That way you can see that I'm being real with you and that I do understand your emotions, guess what? This pastor, you would think that he would have one of the, uh, one of the uh, most friends around the world and all that, but guess what? This pastor, there are those days where he felt like he's the only one and the loneliest person too. You might say, how can you think like that? See, I think the same thing like you. I am human like you. I want to tell you something that you're not alone. There are people out there who have not bowed the knee to Baal. But, get, but no, one, no one loves Jesus as much as I do. No one serves God as much as I do. And no one's street preaching. No one's soul winning. Who do you think you are? You think you're the only one serving the Lord Jesus Christ? There are 7,000 out there. There are Christians out there who love Jesus more than you. There are Christians out there who you may not have seen street preach, but they are giving the gospel somewhere out there. And let me tell you something. Out of all those cars, and we were preaching at lost sinners during the street preaching, you would be surprised how many hundreds of them or scores of them are saved Christians who have not bowed the knee to Baal. You would be surprised how many people in this area are King James only Bible believing Christians. You'd be surprised. I mean, I talked with one of the brothers right here. I mean, like, we didn't know each other for a long time, for many years. Who would have thunk, right? Who would have thunk? We're not the only ones who didn't know about that for years. There are many out there. You'd be surprised how many out there have not bowed the knee to Baal, who are King James only Bible believing. Where were they, Pastor? Where are they? They're somewhere out there. And they may not be like you. They may not be where you're at. But they are out there and you're not alone. Amen. And you got to realize that those people, there are people rooting for you. Well, no one sent me a letter. No one in church today said, oh, I did a good job. I understand your feeling. No one said, oh, brother, I can see you're suffering. I'm praying for you. 
I came to this church every Sunday and no one hugged me and said, Oh, brother, I, I sympathize with you. Pastor Kim didn't even notice my woes and all that. Oh, you know what? Look, man, you got to realize this is that, okay, no one publicly rooted for you, but you'd be surprised how many of them are rooting for you. Do you know this pastor was so encouraged? I just posted a video yesterday, and I was so surprised how many people who I never saw commenting before or rarely comment, some of them who I didn't see for years, all of a sudden I just see floods of comments, floods of comments and comments and comments and comments. And I was so touched, and I was so overjoyed of people saying, we don't want you to quit. We want to pray for you. We didn't know you went through suffering. We didn't know what kind of enemies were attacking. Want you to know we're rooting for you. We're praying for you. San Jose Bible Baptist Church, we're not alone. Yes, you got to realize there are many people out there who are praying for our church, yeah, even exactly. if you don't pray for this church, even if you don't pray for yourself. There are people out there that are rooting for you, and you don't see them. You never see them until you go to heaven. You never see the soul saved. Oh, no one got saved in my street preacher. No one got saved when I personally witnessed to them. No one got saved. You'd be surprised how many are in heaven saying, thank you so much for leaving that track. Thank you so much for preaching that gospel on the street. Thank you so much for posting something online. Thank you so much. I, well, you know, I never met you at my workplace before. Well, yeah, I know, but I saw your testimony at the workplace and that of touched my heart and I silently received Christ for my salvation even though I'd never went to you or befriended you. You'd be surprised how many people will be up in heaven who will be rooting for you and got your back and are saved like you and are Bible believing like you. You're not the only one. You may be the only public one but guess what? Invisibly there are many people who got your back and we're not the only ones. So that should encourage you. You know why you shouldn't quit? I'll tell you why you shouldn't quit. Because of all those invisible fruits. Oh, I saw zero fruit. You mean zero public fruit. What about the hundreds of in, 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 invisible fruits? Huh? How about the hundreds of invisible fruits that you didn't see? What are you going to do with those? Huh? You're going to give all that and flush it down the drain? God knows what fruits you produced. God knows the fruits that you produced even though you didn't see it. And God's like, man... And there's Gene Kim going, oh, you know, oh, I'm all alone, and this is so hard, and God, what am I going to do with everything else? How are you going to take care of this and that? And, you know, the Lord's just probably chuckling up in heaven and saying, oh, my goodness, did you see all these fruits? Gene, did you, did you see, uh, imagine how many souls you're going to see up in heaven. Imagine all these people who became bio-believers when you go up to heaven. He's going to look at you, 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 and you, and he's laughing up in heaven, perhaps, where you're sobbing in tears and breaking down, and I understand that feeling because I've been through it, breaking down in tears, sobbing and feeling alone and broken down and saying and saying, thinking that everything is given up and you feel like things are too rough and hard and you're about to throw in the towel. God is right now up in heaven and he's probably chuckling. Man, did you, look at all this fruit, this fruit and that fruit, this fruit and that fruit, this fruit and that fruit, and you're going to drop all these fruits. You're going to drop all these fruits, huh? Imagine you gave up 200 fruits that you didn't see just because you didn't see a single fruit. Just because of one public fruit you didn't see, you throw in a towel and give up 200 invisible fruits up in heaven. Imagine when God opens up the judgment seat of Christ, plays your life. It is literally a dramatic, we're going to see the greatest drama and the most exciting television show you're ever going to see. It's your life. And he's going to have different people's lives intertwined with you. And he has a drama and the action and the excitement and the climax and a plot twist set up where the hero is about to throw in the towel and he doesn't see. But hundreds of miles away, a person just somehow received a chick track, bowed on his knees and received Jesus Christ for his salvation. You know why you can't quit? Because there are many people, you have many invisible fruits, even though you don't see a one public fruit. That's why you can't quit. That's why you can't throw in the towel. You know why you can't quit? You can't throw in the towel? Because of fear. Amen. Look at Jonah. Look at the book of Jonah chapter 1. Ah, I don't want to do this work. I want to run away from God. Can I tell you something, friend? You should be afraid when you throw in the towel. Hey, Amen. Oh, I thought this was going to be good, positive stuff. No, sometimes you need something negative to Amen. get you back in the fight. You That's need something right. that doesn't feel good to motivate you to not quit. You need that sometimes too. 
and let's I'm gonna I'm gonna put myself in here now the word of the Lord came unto Gene Kim saying arise go to San Francisco that great city and cry against it for their wickedness has come up before me but Gene Kim rose up to flee <laughs> Unto where? Somewhere at the south where there's a bunch of Bible believers right there. Amen. And went down to Joppa, and he found a ship going to Tarshish. For he paid the fare thereof and went down into it to go with them unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. But verse 4, But the Lord sent out a great wind into the sea. Not only that, look at verse 17. Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah. You know why I can't quit? I'm afraid to quit. Amen. That is good stuff, amen. You know why I can't quit? I'm afraid to quit. Yeah. I'm afraid that once I throw in the towel, what the devil's going to do to me, what the consequences of my sin that I will reap, and what the Lord will do to spank me back. Yeah. Amen. And I'm going to tell you something. If you don't come to San Jose Bible Baptist Church anymore, you should be afraid. If you unsubscribe and don't, don't want to participate in a Bible-believing internet ministry anymore when you're all by yourself, you should be afraid. If any of you want to stop reading your Bible and praying and stop serving God, you should be afraid. Right. If any of you want to become an atheist after this because God has been unfair to you, you should be afraid. Amen. This is not a time where I start to heal your little wound and comfort you. You already heard enough of that. You need to realize that there's going to be a bigger wound if you don't get that wound taken care of. That's right. Amen. Amen. You should be afraid. You know what I'm afraid? I'm afraid that as, uh, once I find the first flight, to go back to the south somewhere, the Lord might send in some lightning and I can't sleep peacefully after that. And I might go, oh man, what if the plane crashes? I'm afraid to go to the car and run away someplace because the Lord might just send a little car to hit next to me or a truck to run me over. Oh, pastor, you shouldn't say stuff like that. Uh, that's scary. Yeah, good. You should be scared. You need to hear Amen. this stuff. Amen. Oh, I'm not coming to church anymore. I want to stay in my home. You should be afraid. Yes. You should be afraid. The Lord might just send lightning down from heaven and just burn down the roof. Lord, just might send in some, some nasty thing happening in your house so you can feel miserable at home. Yeah, you should be afraid. You should be afraid. Oh, no, you know what? Uh, I want to go hang out with my worldly buddies. Oh, no, I want to stick to my workplace. Oh, no, I'm just too busy with my schoolwork. Oh, yeah, you should be afraid when you go to there. You should be afraid. The Lord might just send something bad happening at school or at work or with your friends going on. You should be afraid. I'm afraid to quit. I'm afraid to quit. And that should be the reason why you shouldn't quit. You know why you shouldn't quit? Because you're, you should be afraid. If there's nothing that can encourage you or comfort you, at least be afraid, will you? At least be afraid to stop mentioning the name of Jesus. Be afraid to bail out on the Lord. Because you don't know what's going to happen to you, what the Lord might chastise, what the Lord might take away from your life. He's, he has some great big fish out there. And he, you got to realize this. You're not safe until you stay in that ship. And if you, as long as you stay in the ship of the Lord Jesus Christ, the ship of Zion, you're safe. Once you get out of that ship, God has a big whale about to swallow you up. And that big fish is the world, the flesh, and the devil. I want to thank God that if my emotions of joy can't keep me in the fight, but rather depression and misery. Misery. At least I have an emotion that's not dull yet, and that's fear. Amen. Oh, I'm depressed. I'm miserable. You know what? I'm not coming back to church anymore. Then do you have an emotion called fear at least? Let that at least run through your blood a bit. Now some of us are going to come to street preaching and visitation bright and early and going to go, okay, I'm here. Let's do it. Let's do this. You know? <laughs> You're not going to come to visitation, street preaching, and church anymore uh, like that. No, you're going to go like this, like the fear of the Lord, and you're going to come in. You'll be wide awake after that. You're not going to be tired, depressed, and down in the dumps. No, you're going to have the fear of God running in your blood, and you're like, okay, I'm here. I'm safe. Amen. You know why? Because the Lord, what does Hebrews chapter 12 say? It says, for whom the Lord loveth. He's not doing this because he's a mean God, because he loves you. He knows that once you get out in your own way and direction, you're going to face a lot of hurt. You're going to face in a lot of bad consequences in your life. 
And as a father who cares for a child who misbehaves, who goes in the wrong direction, the father is responsible and accountable. Otherwise, he's a horrible father if he doesn't intervene. That father, he has to take the responsibility on his shoulders to set that child straight and get that child back in the right path. And you know the father, you know what the God the father does? He's not mean to you. He doesn't scourge you with a whip as soon as you get out of his will. You said, but the verse says, whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. I thought that's what the verse said. The father scourges the son. Yeah, but guess what? You made that scourge come down. You know why? Because he told you, he warned you first, then he warned you the second time, then he warned you the third time, and then he sent some little thing, like a little flick of a finger to get you back into to the path. Then he started to use his hand a little harder, then it turned to a fist, and you still don't get the memo, so he feels like that he has to do a whip to scourge you back in the right path. That's right. And that beating, you know I'm right, because I'm telling you, I'm like you, I understand the feeling. That whip comes down even harder and harder, and some of you are just still too blind to see it. You know why we can't quit? I'll tell you why we can't quit. Because there is a God over there who judges. And that's what matters at the most. And Ecclesiastes 12, the wisest man in the world, said this. He complained and whined about his riches, his fame, his lovers, his possession, and his knowledge. He had everything in the world. He drowned himself in alcohol. He drowned himself with pleasures. He drowned himself with everything that he can do. But you know what he said? Vanity, vanity, all is vanity. And he realized at the end what mattered was not what made him feel better. What eased his suffering. What mattered was what? The emotion, fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good. Or whether it be evil. That's what matters at the end. It's not what, God, you should bless me. You should answer my prayer. You should do something here. You should give me a fruit. No, what matters is fearing him and doing your duty. And that's it. Amen. Amen. That's the point. Because there's a judgment at the end where he records every secret thing you've done in your life and says, okay, how much have you done for me? See, that's what matters at the end. What, what does it matter? Who cares if your life is miserable, boring, depressed, everything's unfair in life. What good is all that at the judgment seat of Christ? What does it matter when all the works you've done for Jesus Christ turns into smoke and God can't give you eternal rewards? This world's going to burn. Your life's going to turn to dust. Everything you worked hard for, you can't take it with you to the grave. But your gold, your silver, your precious stones, your five crowns, your cities to rule on this earth, and this, not just this earth, but the whole universe itself, things to own and to rule, to inherit, all yours. That's eternity. That's what matters at the end. And all you whine about and complain is just a little more money, a roof over your head, some fruit right in front of your face. Really? What about the gold, silver, precious stones, and all that that lasts for eternity, huh? What are you looking at? Set your affection on things above and not on things on this earth. You looked at this earth too much, and that's why people are quitting, giving up the fight. Don't throw in the towel. Jesus saves, Roman slaves, turn or burn, repent or perish. All that matters is that King James Bible. All that matters is your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This is everything that we stand for, that we preach on, what we should be doing. Amen. And not care what the world thinks and not care how we Amen. feel or the sufferings we go through. Look, stop sobbing about your own afflictions and people looking down on you and no one coming to church, no one getting saved, people leaving you, people think you're a nut job. What matters all that at the judgment seat of Christ? You yes. think that those things will matter at the that's judgment it. seat of Christ? Ha ha ha, you're a fanatic. You think that's going to be up there at the judgment seat of Christ? No, they're going to bow on their knees and fall flat on their face and say, Jesus is the Lord. Yes. Well, all that matters is you and him at the judgment seat of Christ and him asking you this, what have you done for me, child? You know why I can't quit? There's too much to lose. I'm too afraid to lose it all. You know why you can't quit? You worked so hard this far 
And I can't believe that there are still saved King James only Bible believing Christians after seeing and working so hard and all that they've done for Jesus Christ throw in the towel when some little mishap, when some trial, when some little suffering happens in their life. Well, it's not. How dare you call it little? It's big. It's going to be little when you go to the judgment seat of Christ. It, what? It was only a month long or a year long or three years long? That's so little compared to how long? Eternity upon eternity times three years times three years times three years times three years times three years. Times three years. So little you throw in the towel for. So little that you wasted your time on and that you want and desire when you got all eternity in the palm of your hands. Every head bow and every eye shut. The altar call is open. Every head bowed and every eye shut, please. The altar call is open. If the Lord laid it upon your heart, feel free to come down on the altar's floor and to pray to the Lord and spend some time praying to the Lord. You can spend some time on your seat praying to the Lord yourself as well. You know what? You can't quit. There are so many reasons why you can't quit. You know why you can't quit? There's something in you that still loves God. That's why you can't quit. There's something in you that loves that Bible-believing church, loves the old-fashioned hymn, loves that King James Bible, loves Bible-believing truth. There's something in there that still loves Jesus who died for you. You know why you can't quit? I'll tell you why you can't quit, because you've already developed so many invisible fruits hundreds and hundreds of invisible fruits in your hands and you're going to throw all that away because you just want one public seeable fruit really so many invisible fruits 7,000 who have not bowed the knee to Baal you know why you shouldn't quit because you should be afraid oh I'm too afraid if I pursued my own way of life and my own way of happiness, happiness what I think gives me joy I'm too afraid to step outside the will of God. There's no better joy, there's no better safety than in the hand of God's will, not my will. You don't want to go down the path. You don't want to go astray. If any of you don't know if you can go to heaven after you die, today can be the day of your salvation. Quick question. If you're to die today, are you a hundred? A hundred percent sure you can go to heaven? You might say, man, pastor, I don't know if I can go to heaven after I die. I'm not 100% sure. You can get saved right now. Right now you can get saved. You might say, well, how do I get saved, pastor? It's very easy. Three things. That's it. One, because you sinned, you're going to burn in hell. So sin is your problem. But number two, Jesus is God who died, buried, and resurrected so his blood can wash away your sin. See, that's why Jesus died and did all that. So his blood can wash away your sin. So all you have to do is believe in that blood of Jesus to solve your sin. You might say, well, don't I have to go to church? Don't I have to get baptized? I have to be a good person. I have to start living for Jesus to go to heaven. No, it's not what you do. It's what Jesus did with his blood. So you rely on the blood, don't rely on yourself to get you to heaven. So all you have to do is number three. So here's number three. This is the last thing you got to do. So sin is a problem, remember, that you're going to hell. So you feel sorry as a sinner. And when you're sorry as a sinner, you only rely on that blood of Jesus to save you. That's it. That's all you have to do. You might say, well, I want to do it right now. I want to get saved right now. Okay, that's good. All you have to do is say it to God. And it can be less than 15 seconds. All you have to do is just say to God. Say to God that you're sorry as a sinner and you only trust in the blood of Jesus. That's all you have to say to get saved. You might say, well, I want to get saved right now, Pastor. Can you help me out? Sure, I'll help you out. I can help you out. I'll give you the words on how to say it and you can repeat after me. Now remember this, repeating words in a prayer cannot save you. It's relying in the blood of Jesus, believing on what he did on the cross that saves you. I'm just giving you the words on how to say it. That's it, okay? All right, so if you want to get saved right now, and I'll give you the words on how to say it, you can just repeat after me. 
Don't worry that no one knows who you are and every head is bowed and every eye is shut. No one is looking around. No one knows who you are and I'm not going to point you out. All right. You can just say it. You don't even have to say it out loud. Okay. Just say it inside you. You don't have to say it out loud. You can just say it inside when I give you the words. Okay. You can repeat after me. Dear God, I repent as a sinner. I believe Jesus is God who died, buried, and resurrected so his blood can wash away my sin. I only rely on the blood to save me. I'm not relying on myself or anything good I do to save me. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Amen. All right, if you would just bow your head and close your eyes. One last time, one last time, 60 seconds, and I promise you we're done. We'll be done right after this. Now, no, uh, if you got saved right now, if you repeated those words after me and you just got saved right now, could you slip up your hand real briefly, real quick? I'm not going to point you out. I'm not going to point you out. No one knows who you are, and every head is bowed, every eye shut. Okay, God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Praise the Lord. I just want to be rejoice and be thankful that someone got saved. That's all. All right, let's close with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for salvation through the blood of Jesus Christ. And thank you so much that you are there during the midst of our suffering. And God, after this, I'll tell you one thing, Lord. San Jose Bible Baptist Church cannot quit after this. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Out of all the wrong doctrines that's happening in our day and age at the last days of the church, as the apocalypse is coming even closer, the point of all this, friend, is that you won't be even able to grow in knowledge of the truth, in Bible-believing truth, until you get saved first. The most important question you have to ask yourself after watching all this is if you were to die today, are you 100% sure that you're going to go to heaven? Perhaps one of these wrong doctrines have affected you and you had the improper way of salvation. As you have seen before, the way to get saved is very simple. It's only simply salvation by grace alone without works through the Lord Jesus Christ in this Christian day and age. If you're not sure that you can go to heaven after you die, it's very simple to get saved. First of all, you have to understand that because of sin, God is a holy God, and He cannot even allow 1% of sin into heaven. So He has to judge sin with a burning hell. So it is very important that you got to realize how serious sin is, and you must repent. You might say, well then, I guess I have to clean up all my sins. I guess I have to go to church. I guess I have to get baptized. I have to, I have to be a good person. No, my friend, good works can never save you. Jesus is God who died, buried, and resurrected so that he can pay all the sins for you. You don't have to pay a single sin for yourself. So all you have to do as a repentant sinner is turn to what he did on the cross alone for your salvation. You might say, well, pastor, I do believe only on what Jesus did on the cross to save me. That's great. Then all you have to do is just say that to the Lord. You might say, well, preacher, I haven't prayed much before in my life. I don't know really how to say it to God. Can you help me out? Sure, you could say it this way. Dear God, I know I'm a sinner. As I repent, I put my faith that Jesus is God and that he died, buried and resurrected so that his blood can wash away my sins. I put my faith in that alone to save me, not my good works. In Jesus' name, I pray, amen. Congratulations, my friend, if you meant it with all your heart that you put your faith only on what Jesus did on the cross through his blood to save you, then you are saved. It's that simple, my friend. Now, my friend, it is important to grow in Bible-believing truth. You now know the truth. What are you going to do about it? As the apocalypse comes even more closer and Satan's about his, to set up his kingdom even more, there are many souls dying and going to hell.
and even many more churches out there who don't know right and wrong doctrine. It is up to you now on what to do. And go to our resources site, www.bbcenglish.org, and click on the resources link over there, and it'll give you everything that you need to grow in grace. The next step of your journey now is up to you. We've done our part giving you this movie. All of it was done for free by the love of the people. God bless you.